It's Tuesday and it's time for Falcon Focus. Happy New Year and welcome to a brand new year, a brand new semester of Falcon Focus. We are in season number three, episode number 13, but our first here in 2022. My name is Matt Mendel, being joined in segment number two by Concordia men's basketball head coach Sean Cassidy as the Falcon men's basketball team prepares for round two against Marion. Also a weekend off with CIT being canceled. We'll talk more about that as they navigate through COVID. But first we talk with Ellie Fuchs, who is kind enough to join us. She's part of the women's lacrosse team, but has also had a very exciting month in which she had the opportunity to compete in the U.S. Olympic speed skating trials. So Ellie, thanks for joining us here on Falcon Focus. I want to start with speed skating and, and how you, you got involved, how you got started in the sport. Um, so I played hockey my whole life for about 14, 15 years. Started out when I was five. Um, right before I went to college, I was trying to decide if I wanted to play college hockey and I was looking at my options and I had an old hockey coach actually reach out to me asking me if I wanted to try speed skating because he noticed how fast I was on the ice. Um, I kind of spontaneously picked up the skates one day and I ended up really liking it and have been doing it for four years now. You know, it, it's interesting because I, I read a story that is on the Concordia website about your speed skating experience and, and one of the, the points in the article talked about your speed quite a bit. Have you always been fast on skates? Um, I think when I was obviously starting out when I was younger, it was a little wobbly. It wasn't the best. But I think as I kept practicing, I think that was really what I what stood out about me the most is that um you know, from a young age I was fast, whether it was in soccer, track and field, hockey and now speed skating. So what is it about speed skating that you enjoy? Um, I really like my teammates, honestly. Um, even though it's an individual sport, we do a lot of training um, in a big group, about seven or eight of us. Um, I really enjoy that. But I also really like um, how much focus it requires and how all the opportunities that I have and how much I really need to pay attention on, like, technique and stuff like that. So how does that work? So you mentioned a coach reached out to you, trying to pique your interest, and then you get, you know, the opportunity to join a team or do you have to find a team? How does it? How do you go about uh, – you know, get involved in the sport? Um, so the coach that reached out to me is actually my coach now, and that's kind of how I found the team because I ended up really liking him. I like his coaching style. I like the facility that we're at. But if you really join if you join the sport, you can really join any team that fits your, you know, personal needs, like whoever you like best, really. So did you know much about the sport when you got involved? Did you have to do a little studying, a little research, or how did you go about just approaching? No, I honestly didn't know really anything about the sport. I just knew that you skated as fast as you could in, in a circle, honestly. Um, and I'm still learning a lot about the sport. There's a lot of different distances and different races that you can do. And I'm even in long track, and um, we were doing short track the other week, so that's like a completely side sport kind of so there's a lot of learning as I'm going along these years so outside of practice outside of training are there many opportunities to go out there and compete in, in different events yeah so um, you can do any of the distances really like unlike track and field where you typically are just like only doing like a 100 or 200 in speed skating you can really do all of them if you really choose to um, once you get older you kind of start to focus on your own individual races um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of traveling. I've gone to Canada quite a few times. Oh, I've wow. gone to Salt Lake City and Minnesota, and those are pretty much, and, like, obviously Milwaukee, too. So, Do you have a favorite place you visited so far? Um, I really like Calgary in Canada. That's probably my favorite rink, and I just like being in Canada. It's fun to go international and race against new people. When you started, did you ever envision that you would get the opportunity, obviously in your own backyard on top of it all, but to, to compete in a U.S. Olympic speed skating trial? No, I actually had no idea that I was even close to getting it. I I raced one time last year, and I made the qualifying time, and I didn't know until somebody told me, like, oh, congrats, you can skate it next year, the trial's next year, and I had no idea. So, And I didn't really think much of it. I kind of thought, oh, it's just another race, but I didn't realize until this year as we were training for it how big of a deal it was for future opportunities. And I think the cool thing, too, for you at least, and maybe from a comfort standpoint, it is – in your own backyard, a, a rink that you're very familiar with at the Pettit National Ice Center in Milwaukee. Take us through that experience. You know, how did, how did it go? You know, maybe what did you learn? You know, just getting that opportunity. What did you learn about the sport? What did you learn about yourself? What did you just 
How did you take in that whole experience? Um, well, it was super nice being in Milwaukee because, like, I had trained there multiple times for hockey, like, throughout my years, like, since I was five. I had been skating there, and it's so close to my house, you know. Um, but as I'm going, I'm learning that there's so much more to the sport than I, you know, originally thought. Like, there's just a lot of technique that you have to be good at. There's a lot of strength that I got to still gain. Um, and I'm super young, I think, into the sport. Like, four years is really early. A lot of people who do this, they've been doing it for, like, 10 12 15 years so there's a lot to do but i'm enjoying it so far so qualifying for the winter olympics is that now a goal for you was it was it a goal when you started obviously you said that you didn't even know you were that close to getting the opportunity to even be in these trials is that now become a goal of yours i think once i made the qualifying time for the trials i think it definitely is now um i do think though it's going to be quite a while down the road i don't think i don't think in four years i'm going to be you know top three in the u.s necessarily but i think maybe eight years down the road i'm hoping that that's a goal um obviously my coach believes in me and i have all my teammates that are backing me up too and obviously my parents are super supportive so i do hope that that's some somewhere in the future for me yeah when you go out there and compete what's your strategy what's what's your approach what's your mindset and how has that maybe changed as you have gained more and more experience yeah, so in the beginning, I really didn't think anything, just literally the only thing I was telling myself was just to go fast. I had nothing in my mind. But obviously, like I said, as you continue learning about like the technique, you really have to think like, don't worry about the person that you're racing against. Don't worry about what your teammates are doing. Um, you know, erase pretty much everything in your mind. Just focus on you are at the line. Do what you know how to do. Your body's going to do it before you really realize it. So that's kind of what I think when I go to the line. I read, too, and you've mentioned it already, but but you and your two siblings grew up playing hockey. Why hockey for the three of you? Um, I, Honestly, I'm not really sure. My uncle and my dad had played it growing up, and then I think when my brother was born and he tried it, then I was like, okay, well, we have all the skates. We got the gear. I might as well try it. It was just kind of, like, guaranteed for me to try hockey. And it, being a girl, it's not, um, like, in Wisconsin especially, there isn't that many people playing, like, mm -hmm. more so in Minnesota. So it was kind of like, okay, this is something that I can do. It kind of sets me apart from other people. And, yeah, I liked it a lot. As you mentioned, okay, so you played hockey in high school, and you mentioned that that was one of the decisions you had to make was would you maybe pursue hockey at the collegiate level. Was that a tough decision to, to pretty much give up the sport? Yeah, it was, mainly because it had been part of my life for so long, and it really, like, defined who I was. So that's why my last year of um, hockey was my junior year of high school. I actually did hockey and speed skating at the same time mm. because I wasn't really ready to make the full transition to speed skating, and I wanted one last year of, you know, being on the ice with the team, you know, scoring, stuff like that. Well, bringing that up, how much of a commitment is speed skating? It's a huge commitment. I'd say it's even, no offense to other D3 athletes, but I'd say it's a hu much more big of a commitment than um collegiate sports it's we train starting end of may and we go all the way until march so it's no kidding. it's a lot yeah it's a really really long sport um it's like it's six days a week um really don't have that much off time um we do everything from running to weightlifting to skating to cycling and it just it's a lot of time on your body and on your mind but um, if you like it, you might as well keep going with it. So, I want to touch on it. We'll get to it as we go along, so I don't want to avoid the topic now. But I do want to talk about time management because i got to believe you know you have a calendar and you're probably keeping track of where you're at when and with your schooling on top of playing college lacrosse, speed skating. I mean, there's a lot going on, a lot of different moving parts. But, you know, going back to hockey real fast, besides that sport in high school, you also at Brookfield Central High School played lacrosse. Had you played lacrosse prior to being a Lancer? No, I I actually didn't. A lot of the hockey girls in high school, they also played lacrosse, and they told me, hey, you should try it because it's very similar hand-eye coordination skills. And like I said, like they, they knew I could run. They knew I was fast, and they said this would be good for you. So I gave it a shot, and, you know, because how similar it is to hockey, I ended up – I loved it, and I thought I was pretty good at it, you know. So I joined club teams following in that in the summer, and I did that all four years of high school, and that's kind of what led me to Concordia is – both that it's close to the pettit so I could train for skating in the winter, but then also in the spring I can do lacrosse here. So is your thought, okay, if I can't play hockey, I'd like to at least try to play lacrosse on top of speed skating at this level? Yeah, so I knew that if I chose to do hockey and speed skating, it would be, I think, just a little too stressful because sure. they're the same exact season, and I wouldn't have been able to commit to really either one of them. But I think, 
you know, I wasn't, I was so new to lacrosse that I was like, oh, I love it so much. I don't want to give it up just out of, after four years. Like, I want to keep doing it for another four. So that's why I really chose to do it. It's kind of unique. We've had other athletes on this show in kind of the same boat. But when you look at your hockey and lacrosse programs at the prep level, you're part of a co-op with Brookfield Central and a few other schools in the area, especially for hockey. But one of the co-ops is the Brookfield Central rival, Brookfield East. And is that kind of unique where you're all of a sudden now teaming with what are otherwise rivals in other sports? Yeah, it is a little weird. Um, I mean, the thing is, like, I didn't really sp – I think the rivalry is more in, like, football and basketball more so. When I played hockey, it was like I was seeing girls all the way from Pewaukee and Eisenhower and Tosa just to, like, make a team. So when I saw the girls from East or whatever, we'd always have, like, you know, a little bit of fun rivalry sure. at practice and stuff. Like, oh, we do Central versus East girls. But, I mean, it was still nice, like, branching out, just meeting new people from a different school, but still in the same area. So, yeah, I really like that aspect of it. All right, so from Brookfield to Concordia, as you mentioned, getting the opportunity to play lacrosse, being close to the Pettit National Ice Center, all factoring in your decision to come in here to the Mequon campus. So with a major also in healthcare administration, speed skating, lacrosse, let's go back to how do you manage it all? Um, well, a lot of discipline, honestly. That's like, I again, like discipline, motivation, and time management are like, and responsibility are like my four main key things that I always have to keep thinking about. So, you know, making sure I get up at a good time, eating right, sleeping right, getting all of my schoolwork done properly, making sure I do a good job in school to begin with. But then I got to shut all of that off and just focus on my sport when I go to practices at, at the, you know, in the end of the day. So it's a lot to focus on and it takes a toll on you mentally at times. But if you manage it right and you have the good support system too, like I said, like my coaches, my parents, all of my friends too, that really helps. So, Like everything else during this pandemic, has that factored in at all as far as maybe messing up? your routine a little bit with whether practices or competitions or school is virtual cancel all that goes in and all that's happened in the last now two years yeah so COVID definitely has played a huge part of it so last year we weren't able to travel a lot for speed skating which I mean was convenient for doing school for the first year in college because I didn't have to worry about you know bringing stuff to a different state or whatever and training at the same time while trying to do online school but this year it's been a little bit challenging because of COVID. So luckily, since we have Zoom and stuff like mm -hmm. that, I was able to join my classes on Zoom when I had to go to Canada and stuff like that. So that was convenient for me. But it does it's definitely more challenging to not be in person and to be doing your training at the same time. So, so if you ever get a chance to catch your breath, what do you like to do? I Okay, I really like um, – a lot of times speed skaters will say, oh, I just like to sleep and not do anything <laughs> because we're so active. But I really do like spending time with friends and occasionally I go and visit my family. Um, I like to like and I like the Mequon campus. I like going to Cedarburg and Port Washington and, you know, trying new places in Milwaukee and stuff like that. You mentioned a big part of your routine is just the sleep. Mm -hmm. So do you have a certain time you have to be in bed by, especially when you're in speed skating season? And you like to get up by, or how does that routine work? Um, well, this this semester is a little difficult because I have an 8 a.m. every single day of the week. So I, you know, I'm waking up a little earlier than I normally do. But speed skating, yeah, I like to try and get to bed, you know, way before midnight, like 11 at the latest, because I need, you know, eight hours of sleep at least in order to skate properly the next day. Like it really takes a toll on you if you get only like like students. I'd say. You know, I hear them say, "Oh, I got like three or four hours of sleep." I'm like, "Yeah, I could not no. skate if I were to do that." So. Um, yeah, so you definitely have to get to bed at a good time and wake up at a good time and obviously eat right. And then racing on the weekend, we race on Saturdays, and those usually start. Those are early mornings. We start races at, like, 9 a.m., got to get to the rink by, like, 7. So, Well, it, i, I got to believe the chaos is starting now with second semester underway. Lacrosse will be here, too, before you know it. Let's talk about lacrosse for a moment because – this past spring was your first collegiate lacrosse season. You played in 10 games, 7 goals, 7 assists, 18 ground balls, go along with 27 draw controls. Were you pleased, at least individually, with how your first collegiate season went? Um, yeah, I'd say as a team it was challenging because of COVID issues and just how low we were with numbers. Mm -hmm. But I was super happy with how I did. I think um, – I got more playing time than I was expecting, honestly, because a freshman I didn't expect to play. Um, but I think I play, or I think I played a little bit better um, in high school just because I had so much more confidence and the pace was slower. And now coming to college and playing other universities, the pace is so much faster. You have a lot, 
to make, you know, you have to make decisions a lot quicker in the game. So I think it's definitely a challenge to adjust to that. But I was happy with how the season went overall for me, yeah. Well, speaking of adjustments, you know, you talk about time management. Was that an adjustment, too, and just what the demands of a college sport is versus a high school sport on top of your speed skating and academics? Yeah, I think it is for sure. I mean, when you're in high school and you say to a coach, hey, I can't make it, I got another sport going on, it's a lot easier for them to, you know, you know, brush it under the sure. rug because it's easy for, you know, it's just a high school sport. It's not that big of a deal. But in college, especially with speed skating and lacrosse, you know, it's kind of like I have to be 100% committed to both of them. So it's hard because, you know, I want to show up to my skating, but I also don't want to leave my teammates on the lacrosse team hanging. So, yeah, that's a huge adjustment. But, you know, like I said, um, support system is great. And, like, I love the lacrosse coach here. She's super mm -hmm. supportive of all the decisions that I make. So, Well, to wrap it all up, when the lacrosse season starts, it'll be March 5th at Fitting Field, North Central, 11 a.m. Obviously, your mindset is elsewhere at the moment, but as lacrosse season approaches, what excites you about this upcoming season? Maybe what goals or, or what's your thoughts on what could be for your second year? Um, well, I'm really excited to play with some of the new teammates that we got this year. We have some good freshmen that I'm really excited to play with. Um, I'm also just really excited to get back on the field. I'm hoping the weather is good because yeah. last year it was really rainy and cold. Um, but I think also this year I, you know, I have a little bit more confidence because I'm a sophomore. It's not my first year anymore. I'm used to the speed of play. And I also think that, you know, I can be a really good leader to some of the younger players and, like, help them out, which I think will, again, help me with my confidence and just help me overall, you know, perform well in the sport. And obviously you go outside right now. It definitely does not feel like lacrosse weather. But, Ellie, thanks a lot for your time. Continued success with everything you have going on with your time management. And we'll be watching with your speed skating and all the best in the future. Thank you. Stay tuned. More Falcon Focus coming up as we turn our attention to men's basketball and their head coach, Sean Cassidy. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in fulfilling its mission of sharing the gospel. Thanks to our faithful investors, we provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. It's what we do. Because our greatest joy comes from seeing LCMS Ministries and her workers thrive, we will continue to make precious resources available, both today and far into the future. It's our promise to you. We are Lutheran Church Extension Fund. We are Lutheran Church Extension Fund. We are Lutheran Church Extension Fund. We want to be part of your great and exciting work. Welcome back to Falcon Focus. It is segment number two. I'm being joined by the all-time winningest coach in Falcon men's basketball history, that being their head coach, Sean Cassidy, who is back for his 15th season at his alma mater back at the men's basketball helm. And, Coach, your thoughts on, you know, as we go into this week, Marion coming up on Wednesday up in Fond du Lac and then a week off before you're back here again for a matchup against St. Norbert. But your thoughts on where the team is at right now, sitting with a record of eight victories, nine defeats, and seven and five in conference play? Well, I think we're still just trying to find ourselves. We've had different lineups. We've uh, we've had some guys out with injuries who are back now, and uh, hopefully we're we're peaking or at least getting to that point of peaking. Uh, I would say we're we're far from it, but uh, I think this last week showed us some things we're capable of doing. I was going to ask you how pleased were you with the the bounce back in those routes of both Dominican and Aurora after a couple of tough setbacks against Illinois Tech and Marion. Yeah, those were real tough losses for us, uh, both of them in different ways. Uh, so for us to respond with a Dominican win, especially with the limited amount of turnovers, to only have yeah. one turnover in the second half was incredible for us. And, it, and we played 18 different guys, and they all took care of the ball. They all played well. They executed. I was so excited by the end of that, uh, that Wednesday night game, just the way they conducted themselves, that, uh, that we walked out of that night saying, Wow, that was that was an impressive performance, and I'm really happy that the younger guys got a chance to play. And then to come back and do it against Aurora, who was obviously a very athletic, very aggressive team, and to not take care of the ball like we would have liked, but we executed, and we finished on plays, and we shot a extremely high percent from the floor, 
And, and again, that carried over for the whole game. Um, but again, you take a look at, at what uh, Brandon Keller was able to do inside and in both games. And again, we had to limit his minutes along with Jordan Johnson's incredible shooting percentage. Uh, it allowed everybody else to play off those two and, and make us very successful. Let's dive deeper into that win on Wednesday against Dominican first. 113 to 56 was the final. The 113 points, fifth most in a game in program history. But what I liked about that outcome, when you look at some of the numbers, it was a good mixture of inside and out. Team was able to knock down 15 threes, but also 58 points in the paint. So inside outside work in. Oh, absolutely. That's always been our strength. As long as I've been here, that's been our strength of being able to play off the inside and outside game. And again, it's execution. Uh, some things we didn't get done earlier in the week, we got done on Wednesday and and extremely unselfish. I, I want to say we had 34 assists. School in record. The game. And just the way they moved off of each other and played off each other, that was probably the most unselfish basketball uh, that we've seen here in years. So it was, again, a, a point of pride for us that we could we were able to do that. And then, again, our, our younger guys came in and knocked down four straight threes. And uh, <laughs> those are guys that have been just itching to get in and working hard every day, and for them to come in and, and show me what they're capable of doing, that was another moment of, of just pride for them. And besides the assists, you mentioned it, taking care of the basketball, only seven turnovers. He was in the game for the Falcons since December 21st of 2019. Then again, fast forward to Saturday, a win against Aurora, 167 outside of maybe a tie or two early, never trailed in that contest. And the first time now for the Falcons, their NCAA era, they have scored 100-plus points in back-to-back -back games. And again, hot shooting, good ball movement. But also in this game, got to the free throw line, and maybe from a turnover standpoint, you overcame 24 turnovers. Yeah, I would say that would be right, <laughs> overcoming that many turnovers. Uh, that when we got good shots, we hit them. And when we worked the ball for those opportunities, good things happened for us. And, again, those are things that we just need to build off of, that we need to limit the turnovers. But at the same time, focusing on, on the execution on the offensive end, but then an incredible defensive performance. To hold a team like Aurora to 67 points, uh, with their fast style and the number of possessions in those games, that's a that's a real mark of, of improvement for a team that we can protect the paints, we can protect the rim, and uh, and put some pressure on them as well. You talked about some of the players, or at least the bench play, and a couple of points I want to highlight. Matt Levine, 11 points, 7 rebounds. Grant Karsten, 13 points. Again, a huge pick-me-up from that bench. Oh, absolutely. And, and again, that second unit, as we're, we're kind of falling more into roles, that second unit goes out and does everything right. They work so hard. They do all those little things, uh, even in the beginning of the year, things that don't appear in a stat sheet, that they may not have anything uh, for stats at the end of a game. But you know what? They moved the ball. They set the screens. They defended. They boxed out. They did all those things that may not appear in a scorebook. And, and now to see those things translating into hitting open shots, converting on, on opportunities, and – I'm just so happy for them. What have you seen from Garrett Hoffman, who's had some nice performances this season? And I would, I would argue he might be your best three-point threat. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. When Garrett gets hot, he is incredible. In practice, he will knock down five, six, seven in a row, and everyone knows it. And when he gets to that point, find him, and he'll make something happen. And even if he's, even if he's cold, you know he's always on the verge of hitting a shot. Uh, so it's, it's just great that he's still being aggressive that he's still attacking, he's still getting to the rim, but also uh, hunting his shots. Jordan Johnson is Jordan Johnson, and so far 1,938 points in 111 career games. Program's all-time leading scorer and getting on the verge of, of 2,000. When you look at it, not just the scoring, but he shoots at a high percentage, but when you look at his game in five seasons now on this campus, how have you seen it evolve in that time? Well, we knew Jordan could score, and coming in as a freshman, he was – he was a scorer, and uh, and now to see where he has grown, I would say his his junior year with his rebounding, uh, to his senior year completing most plays that he's involved in, to this year, he's been a great leader for us. He's the first one off the bench to to cheer for guys. He's the first one to to congratulate guys and and talking on the bench, uh, just his his maturity that he's showing. And then he gets into a game and he just hits every shot. <laughs> and you know, uh, early in the season when we were struggling to score, uh, 
we required him to score 25 points, maybe 30 a game if we were going to stay competitive. With that tough preseason schedule, we needed him to score. And uh, he's willing, <laughs> willing to do it, but he still didn't overshoot. Uh, you just take a look at his shooting percentages throughout the, the season. Everybody knows he's a scorer. Sure. I, I think he's one or two in the conference in scoring right now, and everybody knows it. And he's still going to get that because he's got so many ways of doing it. Well, with that being said, I remember we had Jordan on this program, I think it was last month, a couple of months ago, and I asked him the same question, but I want to get a coach's perspective. With that being said, how have you seen teams maybe in those five years, it's probably changed, but how have they approached him? I think he's seen it all. Uh, We've had teams try to full deny him. We've had teams run double at him. We've had teams take cheap shots on him, uh, try to hit him hard anytime he went to the basket, and uh, and he survived. He's found a way to, to finish He's found a way to get open. Uh, I get a credit for the teammates that can get him open and get him the ball when he's open. But I, I think lately teams have been trying to grab and hold him. And uh, uh, quite frankly, I, I think it's been pretty cheap the way the teams are trying to defend him. They're not trying to defend him straight up. I think they're they're trying to to do things outside of the game of basketball and 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 see if an official will call it or not. And to his credit, he's keeping his head. Whereas a couple of years ago, he would get pretty upset about sure. it. And uh, he comes back with a with a new aggression of, okay, I'll just get to the free throw line and I'll beat you from there. Now, outside of Jordan Johnson being the program's all-time leading scorer, I mentioned you're the all-time winning as coach in the program's existence. You had Jared Jurst, the program's all-time assist leader. I mean, up and down, it really is a, a who's who and a really a special time right now for Falcon men's basketball. But when you look up and down the roster, I guess, how confident are you in the depth of this team. You've mentioned already the capability of this team, but but just how confident are you when you look up and down at what you have? Well, I, I'm very confident that we can go 10 with 11 and 12 being very capable of going in, but we're playing 10 consistently. I, I think the bigger picture of all of this is you have to understand how long I have known these guys. I mean, Jordan's been in the gym since he was a sixth grader. He's always been at camps. He's been at everything, and he's he's lived in here. I've been watching Jared Jurst play against my son since he was a fifth grader. Uh, so Joey Zietlow was in here shooting when his sister was playing here when he was a sixth grader. So this isn't about, uh, okay, I recruited them as seniors. These are these are young men now at 22, 23 years old that I've known since they were, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. And uh, when we talk about being a family, it's truly a family that uh, we care deeply about what goes on. We care deeply about each other. And... Uh, and now these these other guys that are they're falling in, and uh, you even go to like Sam Mierstein, who I went mm-hmm. to school with his mother. <laughs> so I'm gonna I've known him his whole life, or known about him his whole life. This is uh, this is what makes us special. This is what makes this family work. Uh, and as soon as we get to that point of just understanding, hey, let's let's do this for each other. Let's let's all care about each other as much as as we want to. I mean, great things are gonna happen for us. And I think this last week we turned some corners on how we did that, and uh, and it shows. And um, So, yeah, it's a special era. It is an absolute special era to be a part of Concordia basketball, and I don't see it stopping. <laughs> Again, was, as I go through these these younger guys, it's just how hard they work every day, knowing they're probably not going to get on the floor, but they're doing all those little things right. And you just see that, and, and sometimes I have to go back and I have to watch the film because they're doing such subtle things that are so good that uh, that allow the starters or the second group to be as good as they are. Another guy I want to bring up, too, and I know you mentioned him already, though, is, is Brandon Keller, who's become quickly a double-doubles machine. Oh, absolutely. Hey, again, you take a look at him, his growth from his freshman year, where maybe he played five, eight minutes a game, uh, to learning under Andrew Fratsky on how to lift, how to work, uh, how to do all those things necessary to be a, a basketball player here at Concordia, and he, he's dominant. There are games where he goes out, and any time he touches the ball, you just assume he's going to dunk on somebody or at least grab the rebound, and, and I'm unrealistic with my expectations. When he misses a shot, I am I am absolutely disappointed. Uh, if he does not rebound every defensive board, I, I'm i hard on him, and he knows that, and he's hard on himself too. But, again, just watching his work over the past four years and knowing what he's capable of doing, that I am completely unrealistic with with my expectations for him. How big of a pick-me-up was it to get Joey Zietlow back from injury here in the, the new year or just before? I mean, you look at a guy like Z, and again, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and he's been here, as you mentioned, it seems like forever. Right, right. 
and he really wasn't himself. Uh, again, we've had this conversation with both Joey and, and everybody on the coaching staff. We have to temper our expectations for someone who hasn't played basketball in 10 months and basically for four months was not allowed to do any kind of physical activity. He was wearing a back brace to games. He couldn't ride on the bus with us to away games. And then once he got cleared, he's worked extremely hard to get himself back into shape, back into playing. And uh, I think personally, I thought he was going to be the all-conference Joey from day one. <laughs> and it's taken it's taken a couple of weeks. And now we see where he's capable of going and some of the things that he's doing in practice. Uh, phenomenal. He, he he looks like himself again. He's moving like himself again. And uh, now you add that to the group that's already been playing well and playing hard. And now you add someone that's a, a very difficult matchup for anybody, plus one of the best defenders in the conference. The word of the interview now is going to become challenge. And the, the first challenge I ask of you is, has it been a challenge? Okay, you get your senior class essentially back for one more year if they elected to take that extra year. Is that a challenge? It, obviously, it's both a blessing, but I also know it could be a challenge in the sense that you got to account for them coming back on top of you have an incoming class. So how have you been able to navigate? It's been tough. It's been very tough uh, as far as that goes because, again, when you're with somebody as long as we are, <laughs> you you know what makes them tick, you know what doesn't, and uh, and you, you have to account for that or know you're older. So it's it can't be the same message, although it's the consistent message of Concordia basketball, but it's also the, the daily message that, I mean, you get, you're allowed most likely about 100 days together between practices and games. And if you're fortunate, like we've been with going to the conference tournament or NCAA tournament, you get up to 120. At some point, you ride on each other. Oh, <laughs> you sure. get on each other's nerves. We, we spend so much time together, and it goes both ways. I, I know that, uh, that I get on them, and, and they're at a point of, of talking to me on the side and going, Coach, man, you're being too hard on us. And I've got to listen to that and then also tell them, hey, here are my expectations, and, and somehow we got to meet on those things. Uh, I think it's been very hard for the younger guys who just assumed, hey, this group's moving on, now it's my chance, and all of a sudden, hey, we're returning three fifth-year guys who are very good. And to those sophomores' credits, oh, they don't back down at all. They go at it every day at practice, and uh, they know their time will come, just not right now. And – so it's, it's been a challenge all the way around. I mean, not even to mention what's going on with the COVID and the testing and what today is going to look like versus tomorrow. And that was my next question from a challenge standpoint. How challenging has it been last two years coaching? Because it's more than just coaching for you. Obviously, you're trying to help manage these players, these student athletes, through what is going on with this pandemic. But also, I know talking with players, talking with you, last year was more than just basketball. I mean, it was a mental challenge to get through what was being thrown at them throughout the courses of January through essentially March? Last year was probably the most difficult year I've ever had coaching uh, because it was all about what can we do today to get to tomorrow. It wasn't about, hey, we play Friday, Saturday. It was how can I keep them safe on Monday so they're allowed to practice on sure. Tuesday or Wednesday and then knowing you can't do too much on Thursday because you got two games ahead of you. Uh, so everything, everything basically revolved around being told at 2.30 or 3 o'clock, can you practice or not? And as far as a coach who, I mean, I like to have control. <laughs> I like to I like to plan out everything and, and having two or three different practice plans in front of you to say, okay, we could do this, this, or this, depending on that test result. Uh, that was tough. And I, and I think that uncertainty really, really hurt us, that we weren't as focused on, hey, let's go out and try to win this game as much as it was, let's get to today. And then... Let's be thankful our school is allowing us to practice or play today, and then we'll take tomorrow. This year we've, we've probably taken more of a, an aggressive approach to if the school shuts us down or the NCAA shuts us down, they shut us down. But thankful for today, and let's, let's make the best of it. Challenges again. CIT is off for the uh, school year, so no CIT this upcoming weekend in Seward, Nebraska. Perhaps next year in Nebraska, third town will be the charm. But what are the challenges of CIT in that when you do get the opportunity to play, I know there's a lot of emotion there in the Battle of Concordias. It's a little bit of a break from conference play. Is that a whole other animal as far as getting the players prepared? Because you go from the challenges of conference to all of a sudden now you get a weekend where it's a whole other set of emotions and atmosphere, and then you come back to conference play. How do you go about dealing with all that? 
CIT is his own animal. Yeah. You've been to a number of those, and uh, you and I have sat around in hotel rooms before games and after games uh, shaking our heads saying, what just happened? <laughs> or uh, either way, good or bad, we've we've been able to shake our heads at, at some things that happens. But, uh, you know, in the middle of a conference season to take a nine-hour bus ride to Nebraska where you're going to practice, then have banquet, games, dance competitions, cheer competitions, uh, thousands of people where it is deafening, and then you finish it on a Saturday night, you get on a bus, you drive nine hours back. Uh, you you have to enjoy that. At the same time, you have to take it for what it is. It is a non-conference tournament in the middle of a season that a lot of people care about. And definitely Concordia, Wisconsin cares about that. So we're disappointed that we can't go this year. To be honest, I, I think it's the right thing, uh, given the, the state of where we are and and – my concern all along was what happens if someone gets sick or what happens if multiple people get sick. And, again, I think we have to think about the health of our student athletes above anything else. And that that forced me to not want to do any kind of overnight trips this year just because of the uncertainty. So I completely support the decision not to do it this year. Uh, we look forward to next year. I, I feel bad for our seniors or fifth-year seniors for not being able to do it for the last two years, yeah. especially when we could have had it at our place next year or this year or or whatever. Uh, because, again, it's it's an awesome experience, but it is its own weekend set aside for uh, for all the, I don't know, the harmony of Concordia, but yet the fight of, of playing a brother. Well, I'm going to get you in trouble here, and I don't mean to, but I, but I kind of want to. Would you like to see CIT move to a different part of the year, or do you like where it's at in the middle of January or at the end of January, middle of the conference season? You're trying to get me in trouble because I have no say. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, okay, okay, but but what's your opinion? If you have to be on record, I would like it move to a different part of the year. I would love to start off the season or a Thanksgiving weekend or somewhere before you get too embedded into the the conference season. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of us. I mean, all four of us have a lot to play for come January, February. And, uh, again, that's well, I've not been asked my opinion. Sure. Except for you right now. Well, and to be fair. So I'm sure this is going to be used against me at some <laughs> other point. But that it's a non-conference well, tournament. So let's move it into a season when, when we can have more flexibility in our schedule. And to be fair, I know over the years, maybe a decade by now, but I've heard buzz here and there about when it would you know fit perfectly. And everyone's got their own opinion. And, not everyone's going to agree, but it is what it is, and it's in a January and it has been for so long. And you know, another thing that that is going to come around the bend is the NAC will announcer is on the verge of announcing that the regular season will end a little bit earlier with the unbalanced schedule. They're going to open up the NAC tournament. Every school is eligible for the men's and women's basketball tournaments. On the women's side, the first couple of seeds will get a first round bye. On the men's side, the top three seeds. Essentially, the games on February 19th are now either canceled or moved and will be non-conference games. February 19th will be the start of the conference tournament, which now means the Falcons no longer will host Lakeland in a women's and men's basketball double header. So your thoughts on that decision now, which one less regular season game, but now everybody gets the opportunity at postseason. I haven't been able to, to fully grasp that yet. Uh, we've gone through a number of different, uh, I don't know, uh, modifications to the conference tournament over the past two weeks, sure. three weeks. So that one just came out, and uh, I'm still in the process of, of wrapping my head around what that means. Uh, obviously, senior day, then it's going to have to be moved. Don't know when. <laughs> so there's another senior day. I was going to ask you that too. So the seniors who got senior day kind of last year, and, and rightfully so, they get a, another senior day. Well, we didn't do senior day last year so because, you guys, okay. <laughs> because I asked them at the beginning of the season, I were they coming no. back? And they all said they were coming back. Okay. So we did not do a senior day uh, last year. So now we now we need to do a little bit of reshuffling to find a date, and, and maybe it's February 5th, uh, when I believe is our last home Saturday game. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, well, then we'll do it on that day. Um, the conference tournament, I'm, I'm a huge fan of everyone in this year. For a one-year deal, um, I just take a look at some of the teams that are playing and some of the, the win-loss records, and I, I know the rosters. And I know a team like Benedictine's had a number of games where they have not had their starters in the game. And so their record doesn't define who they are in, their, in the standings. 
And I, I would hate to see that every year it comes down to the last game of the season to decide probably about four or five teams in or out. It, it's The men's side of the knack has always been tight. So there's always been that last weekend that's going to decide who gets in and who gets out. And I would hate for it to be based on, hey, there was a team that lost their starters for two weeks for COVID, and now they're sitting on the outside. It's not mm-hmm. It's not the player's fault. You know, it's not the coach's fault. So for this year, hey, everybody in, winner take all, strong, <laughs> survive. And now uh, it, technically it's it's the true, you know, uh, automatic qualifier. You prove it. Prove it on the last day of the conference tournament. And if that's us, great. If it's not us, then someone beat us. So, uh, But at least we settle it on the floor rather than uh, based on COVID tests or a coin flip. And again, as of right now, the thought is February 19th will be the start of the tournament, and then thereafter the days will stay the same for the quarter semis championship, as was expected prior to the reshuffling of the tournament dates. And I was asking about that senior day thing. That's something I, I do ponder, not that they don't deserve it, but I was wondering if you had senior day last year, you get a almost like a second senior day. You get double the, the fun. So I, some schools certainly are in that debate now, I'm sure. But uh, finally, I'll wrap it up by asking you about the road ahead. Wednesday is the immediate future. At Mary and a team you just saw last Monday, a makeup from December, a 90-72 to 72 loss. David Britton makes that offense go. That's a team, though, that lives and dodges that three-point shot. What do you expect from Mary in round two after what you just saw here last week? I expect a lot of the same. They beat us. They beat us in every facet of the game. Uh, we know that. Uh, we went back and watched that film over and over again, and uh, they were better than us on Monday night. So we need to – we need to pick up our defensive intensity. We need to pick up our level of, of, of execution. Uh, we need to go back to where we were this past week since we, we last played them and uh, and be able to move the ball and, and get the shots that we want rather than settling. Uh, we need to take care of the ball. Uh, we need to play better, and we all know that. That's our mindset. Is th- There were no excuses for Monday night. They beat us, and uh, – and they're good. I mean, and since they beat us, they've gone on a run of, of putting up a lot of points and, and beating teams by, by a huge margin. So we definitely know the challenge that are ahead of us tomorrow. So that's coming up, uh, as mentioned, tomorrow, Wednesday at Marion, and then no CIT this weekend. So then team will next be in action the following Wednesday right back here inside the John Book Field. It's February 2nd. It's February already, 7 o'clock against St. Norbert. Anything else you want to add? I mean, this is, this is your show. We're just – well, you Watching. know, it's been about five, six years <laughs> since you've had me on, so it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. you gave Three me my shot. <laughs> I feel like we got a lot off your chest. I mean, we, we covered a lot of different topics. Yes, we did. Yes. We should talk more often. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Thank you for joining us for Falcon Focus. Thanks to both of our guests, and it's great to be back for 2022. We'll do it again next week right here on the Falcon Athletic Network.